So let's get started. As I mentioned already, um, I'm Ryan Carniato. I'm the author of SolidJS, and today I'm going to present a bit of an introduction to it. Uh, but yeah, we're going to we're going to talk about primarily. I want to challenge your expectations about the future of what web uh, frameworks look like, and I don't mean purely looks. Um, if you haven't seen it, Solid looks so much like React, it'd be pointless to try and uh, sell it on features. And really, one framework adds a feature, then the next one does. Um, it, I think we're mostly past the stage of kind of differentiating on these features. I'm just going to cut it short and say Solid has a lot of the same features you'd expect in any modern framework, something like React 18. And I'm not going to try and sell too much on performance, at least not through benchmarks. I'm going to th I threw up this slide because uh, you know, you know, it, this has kind of become a meme. You know, blazingly fast. I'm just going to say that Solid is very fast, and we'll kind of leave it at that. And maybe this talk will help you understand a bit better why without just focusing on the numbers. First off, uh, yeah, this, <laughs> this is not a reenactment of a JavaScript framework discussion on Twitter. Um, I wouldn't blame you for drawing that comparison sometimes. Uh, it wasn't long ago that the mere indication, you know, mention of a new JavaScript framework brought anger. But recently, people have been more open to new ideas than they've been for a very long time. Um, there's a sense of waiting for the next big thing. And I don't know. This is often kind of accompanied with this kind of thought. Uh, you know, like people look at the past and they go, oh, didn't React burst on the scenes, conquering jQuery, thrusting web development forward years in a one swift stroke? But I'm, I, I'm not really sure that's how it happened, honestly. Um, history is written by the victors. My memory of events is a little bit different. The time before React was one full of innovation and exploration. Many of the pieces already existed, and React largely showed us how to put it together. And by my best estimation, we're back here right now. So yeah, this, this is the main point I want to get here. Modern front-end development for years has been about components, class components, function components, option components, web components, and for good reason. Components are an essential building block. They make our apps modular and composable. And we owe React a lot, largely for this change in mindset. However, every JavaScript framework, um, they have a runtime implications. The update model and the life cycles are all tied to these components. And this has led to kind of two views of the world. Either you use a top-down diff like a virtual DOM or like tag template literal, or alternatively, you rely really heavily on compilation. But both of these tend to still run on these components that update top-down that re-render. And when you have to you know, run things over and over again, at a certain point, what work the component does starts to matter. And this sort of begs the question what to memo or memoize. And there's a great talk from React Conf last year that kind of addressed this exactly. Um, like if you're building a to-do app, you might kind of approach it like this, um, declare some state, write a, you know, an update handler function, and then map over some to-dos. And this is perfectly fine. And if anything changes here, we just re-render the list and it's a virtual DOM. This is a React example here, right? So it's not that expensive. We just diff it, update what changes, and you're pretty good. But we might still want to optimize. And as your program grows, you apply more optimizations. Maybe you pass some props in from above. You have new uh, conditions you need to meet for your requirements, You know, adding a filter, theming. And it, it starts looking like this. Um, there's nothing wrong with this. People you know, annotate stuff for performance, things like memo, use memo, use callback, adding dependency arrays. And in the end, we actually have things still executing exactly what we want. But I'm going to say it's a bit of a departure from where we started with. It puts a lot of onus on us as developers. So what else can we do? Well, we can compile it. Um, this meme floated around about a year ago. I definitely felt the lack of dependency array envy from some circles. I mean, after all, wouldn't it be better just to express our intent with less code? Um, hold that thought for a minute. Um, we're going to get back to it. OK, so here's like a fake compiler. This was also from that talk. Um, this isn't what you write. This is what like the compiler would generate. But I, I want to sh show this off because it's actually not that different from what Svelte does, essentially, right? Um, a bunch of shallow checks at a bunch of points. You see this kind of memcache thing. Don't worry too much about the code does. I'm just trying to point out that like we're checking against some kind of cache and then only executing the little code snippets that we need to. But the common ground, even in this model, is user you know does some kind of event, updates state. We mark the component as dirty, and we re rerun it. And then we check against these memoized values to reduce work. It doesn't matter whether you know 
it started as a set state or an assignment. It's actually very much the same thing. And that's what I want to talk about. Like, what if we didn't do this? What if only we ran the code that needed to be run and didn't re rely too heavily on compilation? What if the boundaries of our components didn't dictate the performance of our web applications? And to do this, I need to go back to the beginning. And I mean, really the beginning. So here we are, hello world. Um, we learned pretty early on, we can like set a variable and like log it to the console. And it isn't too long before we're like, oh, we, we can, you know, reset that variable and log it again. And, you know, th this is like your first programming task. And then at, at a certain point, you're like, well, this is a lot of repetition. I don't want to type console log all the time. So you can like pull it out into a function, refactor it. Now it's more dry. Um, and this is great. But at a certain point, you know, when you're writing a real app, you might be like, what if I always want to greet my friend whenever their name changes? And for me, the answer to that was reactivity. And what's reactivity? Well, it's kind of like the heart of pretty much every JavaScript framework. It's how everything stays in sync. And the way I think about it is like a series of live equations, like a spreadsheet. In a normal assignment, when you look at something like A equals B plus C, you expect that at the end of the sum that A is you know, B plus C. But if B or C changes, then you have to do the sum again and reassign A. But with reactivity, it's a little different. See, that relationship I just described, it doesn't hold through time. But with reactivity, it does. If B or C changes later, A is always the sum of that. So yeah, like an equation in a spreadsheet. And what I talk about specifically is fine-grained reactivity. Um, we, we tend to like this in JavaScript frameworks um, because it's like declarative. Uh, relationships are set once, and then they're executed. Uh, you describe the behavior rather than the implementation. And they're very composable because like, there's only really three concepts you need to know. You need to know about the uh, observable state. Uh, I, we call them signals in solid. We need to know about the kind of computed derived values. Uh, we actually call these uh, memos in solid. We kind of similar to the React naming. And then finally, you need the side effects, you know, uh, things like rendering. And we call them effects. But yeah, you, you'll find these language pieces in actually a lot of frameworks. and. Uh, I, I think it's it's important to kind of see that similarity. But there are differences, right? Because some people will be like, oh, so React hook, right? Use state, use memo, use effect. Um, from a language perspective, perhaps, and, you know, Svelte also has lets and dollar signs that actually serve basically the same purpose. But those are both tied to the components. And these composition patterns existed almost a decade earlier in JavaScript, things like knockout.js. Reactivity is a system to itself that has no connection to rendering at all or components. And this is a really important part, but it's probably easier just to show you, right? Well, the first thing we need is a new primitive. Um, setting a simple variable can't cause other JavaScript code to run. So I'm going to introduce something called signal here. Um, what is a signal? Well, it's a getter and setter function. And in this case, I'm returning a tuple here. It's kind of in the middle of the screen. Create signal John. And it's important to notice the like site differences here because if we want to actually access that value in our greeting function here, we actually have to call it as a, as a, as a function. We're calling name as a function, and then we're ca calling a function to actually set the new value. This gives us very clear, you know, this is being read, this is being written. Different libraries take different approaches here, but this is what we've done with Solid. On its own, this doesn't do a whole ton because it's just like a container wrapping of values. So we actually introduce a second primitive called an effect, and this lets us clean our code up a whole lot. Um, what an effect does is it runs once, and then at any time, any variable um, signal that it depends on causes the function to run again. So uh, if we run our create effect here, it'll console log hello friend, which is John in this case. And then if we update that value, like set friend to Mary, um, immediately when we set friend to Mary, it'll run that effect again and log it again. This is kind of the basis of reactivity. But the real power here is that it, it's transitive. And by that, I mean that you can kind of construct and compose behaviors. In this case, what if we made our friends and names uppercase for some reason? I, I don't know why I want to make it uppercase, but I decided to make it uppercase here. We can literally just make a function around it and go friend to uppercase. And now we can still use it in our effect and it still works. And you might be thinking to yourself, um, how does this work? Like, how is this happening? Is this a compiler? There's no dependency arrays, right? Is this magic? 
The answer is actually a lot simpler. Um, this is completely runtime and it's using a JavaScript execution stack. Um, let me show you. It actually takes less code than probably that uh, uh, interview question you had to implement a promise. It's about uh, 30 lines of code. I'm going to trim, trim it down even more to make it a little bit more illustrative of what's going on here. And it all starts with signals. At its core, we can just view a signal as a getter and setter. So I, I got a little code snippet here. And essentially, we return our array or tuple, um, tuple, depending on how you call it. And essentially, the read just returns the value and the write sets the next value. That's kind of like mental model what a signal is. Of course, this doesn't do anything. So I need to add a little bit more code to kind of finish out our implementation here. Um, so I've added a little bit more in here. Um, essentially, we need a way of keeping track of who listens to the signal. So we're going to create a set of subscribers. And from there, we updated our read function. So it's going to ask, is anyone listening? Like, get the current observer. And to be fair, I'm going to show you how that works in a second. But assume it's just going, hey, is anyone listening? And then if there is, it's going to add that thing to its subscribers list and then return the value as before. But now when we write, we set the new value, and then we go through that list of subscribers and rerun those functions. Um, of course, this doesn't make full sense until I bring the other side in here. So uh, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to show what an effect looks like, and this kind of fill, fills in the gaps. Um, the whole trick here is that there's this context array, essentially, that sits in a global space. And when we ask what the current observer is, we're just asking what's on the top of the list. This is a stack. So every time we basically execute our effect and we execute it the first time here we do a little bit of cleanup and then we push ourselves onto the stack we run the provided function and then we pop ourselves off the stack so at any point any signal that runs like the read function can see what the current value is on the stack and know what's going on this this is a little bit, but this is literally the, all the code. I'm actually gonna put it side by side so you can see it here. So if we go back to our like name example with the uppercase in our head, we can kind of go, okay, you know, first thing, create our signal, return our read and write functions. Then we create our effect. Our effect actually goes down and executes the first time and pushes itself onto the stack. So it starts running that function, and that function, you know, reads like uh, what was it, hello upper. Well. It calls upper, upper calls um, our friend signal, which calls the read, at which point it asks, the, you know, what's on top of the stack and it sees that effect. We take it at the point and add it to our subscribers, return the value, finish executing that function, which will console log, you know, our friend's name, and then pop ourselves off the stack. At some point later, someone's going to just update it, you know, set the name to, to Mary. And then all it does is, go through that list of subscribers, execute them again, pushing them onto the stack, reading the signal again ad nauseum, essentially. It just, it just creates this loop where it's always tracking what changes. Um, no compiler, no magic. This is fully runtime. And from that, we can create a primitive for uh, other uh, primitives, like a foundation for it. A lot of them are not completely essential, but in solid, we have something called create memo, um, we have something called create store and create resources. And these are just examples. Uh, create memo is that derivation to do expensive stuff. Create store is proxies that do uh, kind of like granular updates. And create resource is kind of a, takes promises and turns them into signals. Um, but honestly, there's a lot of other solutions that work like this to a certain degree. Things like Vue, MobX, you may have heard of them before. But where we, this goes next is where this gets interesting, okay? So what I'm going to do is I, I want to do a little live coding with you, if that's okay. Essentially, every time we teach this topic, we tend to like use like hello worlds and counters and stuff, um, and we console log it. But what if we did something a little bit more substantial? What I actually want to do is I I want to like create some DOM elements or something. So let's like make an H1 element uh, and what is it? const H1. And instead of console logging, what if we actually using vanilla javascript apis just like set the text content to be whatever this is and actually i'm going to need to uh attach it to the dom so we can see this i'm going to actually clear the dom content first because we our hmr here will just uh 
reload it over and over again while I'm typing. So I'm just going to append our H1 to the DOM. And as we can see, now we have an H1 being attached to the document body, and it has count one. It happened so fast, though. It was zero, but because we set one right away, it just happened too fast. So um, let's create a button. And to save myself a little time, I actually already created this button. So all I've done is using DOM APIs, create a button, set some text to the button, and then on click, now we can set the count. And then everything else is the same as before. So we're using the effect. So whenever count changes, we update just the text for this header. So ding, 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 ding. We have a working counter, right? This is, this is just the vanilla JavaScript. We just built the library a moment ago. This is pretty much all we need here to, to update some text in a DOM element. But um, no one wants to write code like this. It's, it's a lot to write, right? Doing all this vanilla JavaScript. Reactivity is powerful, but we want some more conveniences here. So wouldn't it be cool if instead of doing this, we could just use you know, some other kind of shorthand, maybe a templating language or may maybe something like JSX? What if you know, something like this could compile into something like this? So what will we have here? Click me and then maybe add a, an event handler like on click. And what's our on click doing? Well, it's doing this. So let's add that on here. And we don't need this anymore. It's just a button. And hopefully everything still works. Okay, good, it does. And similarly for this H1, it'd be probably pretty nice if we could just um, not have to worry about a bunch of this stuff, you know. And what Solid does have a compiler here for the JSX. And that's we're in the playground, so this is working. But essentially, what it can do is it can see that you call a function, so it knows that it could be a signal, so it wraps this in an effect automatically. So we don't need that anymore. We can get rid of this stuff. And essentially, we just are returning two DOM elements that we append to the DOM, the same as before, and our counter is still working. Of course, no one no one really writes code like this either. Um, usually, you're like, well, I, you know, I want to compose behaviors. So like, you might be like, I'm going to make a counter, right? And you know, I'm going to call this thing maybe a component. And I could just move this code into here. And then instead of, you know, appending it like this, we I'm going to just call our counter function. It's just a function. And I'm going to spread it in. And what we need to do here is actually return our H1 and our button. So now, OK, this is still working. Let's format this so we can read it a little better. OK. But again, no one really writes code like this. Let's inline it to make it like a little bit more readable. You can probably put the H1 in here. We can probably put, sorry about that. It's always fun using a trackpad, drag and drop. We can grab this button and we can stick that in here. Now we don't need this anymore. And actually, you know, why am I even using an array? Um, let's, let's make it like feel a little bit more XML-ish. We're going to use something called the JSX fragment. And I think I have an extra comma here that I probably don't know, need. And if I format this document one last time, this is starting to kind of compress and make it maybe nicer writing experience. And I'm actually going to import from uh, SolidJS. So we don't have to do this silly render thing at the bottom. I'm just going to go from SolidJS web. Let's get a render function just so that we don't have to bother calling this one function ourselves. So we can just be like render counter into the document body. And with that, we probably don't need any of this. And this starts looking like something you might see in another JavaScript framework. And obviously, it still works, because we're just calling a function that returns some DOM nodes. But there is a huge difference here. And I, I want to point this out here, because you, you might have guessed by watching what we've done so far. If I put a console log in here, and we see this counter down here, if I click this, that counter is not getting logged over and over again. Because this, we just called a function that ran once. The only thing that's updating is we have an effect around this count. So literally, this text node with this number is, is the only thing that is updating when I click that button. We don't need to rerun a component. We don't need to do anything else because we know, because it's reactive. And I mean, we can, we can do lots of fun stuff with this, right? We can, we can set an interval or something. Uh, maybe every second, we can update the count on it as well. We can. Just increment it. Let's let's do that. And 
it's counting up. This counter is not logging. I can also update it manually while I'm doing it. But essentially, like th this is a function that ran and it created some DOM nodes. That's kind of the mental model I want you to have here. And you know, we can we can take this even further because truth of the matter is like, what if we want two counters? Well, we can render two counter components if we want. And because each one has its you know own signal and own references. We see the counter logs twice. That's what the two is. And they each independently update. And they don't update again. You know, they're, they, they, they're, they're just updating that one little text node. But, you know, if you've been kind of paying attention, this is all just a matter of references. So if we took this signal and move it out of our component, now both counter instances are referencing the same signal. And now we have global state. This it doesn't matter which one I click here. They both update, and again, counters only, you know, log the, the initial time when it's originally created, right? Because we have the power of update independent of components, even though you can author it in a very convenient way. And one last demo before I move on here is we can also pass things in as props, um, essentially, into children. So I've now got like an app here and a counter here, and I'm passing our counter now gets both the click handler and it's their children from above. In this case, I've made it so that the first component gets count and the second component gets count times two. And then one increments the count by one and increments the count by two. And what you're going to see when I click here, yeah, this one shows one and times two. And this one I click, it goes up by two. The, these logs only happen once. It doesn't actually matter how many components are in your stack, context, whatever you want to use. You're only updating these two text nodes. Components have no impact on how your component or how your code runs. So like, I like, I think this is pretty powerful, but you might still be like, how the hell is this happening? Well, it's because solid only transforms the JSX. And before I mentioned, if we saw a function, we knew to wrap it in effect. But for components, what we do is we transform the props and we make like, say, you know, the, the children, or in this case, I got a name, we make it a getter function. And what this does is it pushes the evaluation into a function, essentially the same like a signal, so that it flattens the tree. Essentially, it's only the effect at the very end that calls the function and subscribes. We don't have to rerun any components. It just it, it basically wires straight through the whole component tree to be used right where it ends up being used in the end. Um, and there's other implications. Like the last kind of topic you need to know to understand solid rendering is that um, we're returning real DOM nodes. So doing stuff like map might not be the best thing because if, as you know, with a map, you can't break out early and every single time you run it, it maps all the data. And that'd be really wasteful if we had to like create DOM elements over and over again. So we have a helper function solved called map array, which kind of does a memoized map, which means that the data hasn't changed. It doesn't map in those new items and just uses the existing one. But we thought it would actually be better to use the API that you're already accustomed to. Um, because we like components actually fit in quite nicely. And the truth of the matter is, um, this is very composable and it fits with what you'd be doing as your program grows anyways, right? Like, do you want to see what I mean by this? Um, pretend now that instead of just having a list, you actually want a paginated list where there's only 10 items. Luckily, someone else has already created this component. So you import it, right? And replace our four with paginated. And this is the pattern, right? Lists become paginated or virtualized lists. Conditionals become layouts or suspense or error boundaries, right? And, and that's the whole thing. Like if you don't, these are just components. This is not like a fancy compiler thing. If you don't like solids for a component, write your own. It's just a component. So um, it is just JavaScript here, runtime. But it's important to kind of see that these patterns are very composable and reusable. And that's why we like them in solid. So I call this whole thing basically the reactive advantage. There's no hook rules or still closures. Um, templates actually use real DOM nodes. Um, it's a really super low level abstraction. Um, you know, state is independent of components. Component boundaries are for your sake, how you organize your code, not for performance. The performance is good regardless. And with that, we can actually go back to our original demo. Um, I've actually got that to do list from that React um, conference. And I, the reason I want to show this is because. The solid version, in this case, it's using a store, which is the proxy version, but it's the initial version where we created some state, created an event handler, but this one actually is passing the filtered props through and the theme color and everything else, the final version. But there's no 
memo, create memo, um, use ref, dependency arrays, none of that. There, there isn't even, yeah, there's not even a create memo in here. We're literally just going for each get filtered. And what you're going to see is, sure, when we check these boxes, we're actually updating here and, you know, doing some updates. But things are unrelated, like this theme color that's getting passed in as a prop and passed to a child component. Well, I can update it as much as I want. And we're not recalling the filter, re-rendering the list, doing any of that. And that's because it's fine-grained. Each update is completely independent, no matter how many components you have, no matter how big your tree is. It was actually kind of hard to show um, that anything updated because so little does. So I guess what I'm saying is, to summarize this, and as for our um, compiler, if you aren't careful, you no longer have the language to re represent certain ideas. If your whole world is a component, then how do you represent what lies outside of it? This is just illustrative. There's obviously solutions to this problem, but I want to point out that sometimes um, we have to be considered of removing too much from the end developer's control, and that being explicit has its power and its value. And to me, this is all part of a larger trend. I used Solid today to illustrate it, but this is just the beginning. Reactivity has been serving as a common language between UI frameworks for a while now. Solid, Vue, even recently, things like Preact are using fine-grained reactivity or uh, quick added signals too. Um, if you squint, even React and Svelte, which are more component-based, they still have the same language. So why not apply that beyond component boundaries? We've seen this to great effect with Solid, and Vue recently announced that they are actually working on a new compiler, um, Vue Vapor, which is eerily similar to Solid in that it doesn't use a virtual DOM and that it compiles to these fine-grained updates. Um, but it actually has other applications as well. I've been talking about the cost of components now for several years, but recently we've been seeing it uh, applied in amazingly new ways. So the problem is the components that need to rerun means that you need all that JavaScript in the browser, even when you do server render. And a couple of years ago, the Marco team had reached out and realized that some of this fine grain work was actually the solution to handling hydration. Hydration is that reboot um, that happens when the server rendered application starts up. And the reason that it's like so expensive is largely a function of our component model. We didn't have this problem back in jQuery days. But if you can get rid of the runtime components, you can also eliminate hydration. Um, and this has been realized now um, by frameworks like the eBay's Marco. They've been working on the Marco 6, the next version, and Builder.io is quick. And I hope very soon that Solid is going to be part of that list. So it's not about virtual DOM or not, or about diffing or not. You can embed like a whole virtual DOM inside of Reactive System if that's what you wanted. You can do concurrent rendering without a virtual DOM. It's about recognizing that our change model, while very entwined with our UI representation, is not the same thing. For this reason, the conversation around the world beyond components starts with reactivity, a system of change unto itself. Reactivity is already everywhere in JavaScript frameworks, from state management to compilation but we can leverage it best if we fully embrace it and live in its declarative world. So maybe a revolution is not in the cards, maybe just a reactive renaissance, but who knows what new worlds are only just a step away. Thank you.